Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 657. Welcome to Raging Bullets, I'm Sean Whelan, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, the duke of you know, the sultan of strategery, the indestructible bridge defying, was shocked to find out he was also cancelled by the Warner Brothers Discovery merger, so says the elder statesman of the podcast, Segulin. How's it going, eh? <laughs> Jim, on this episode, we're actually doing two episodes this week, so you're going to get a midweek episode from us with comic book content. We're, we're going to be talking about two books, but this episode is all Speeding Bullets related. There was a lot of DC news coming out, including there was an interesting article about uh, a potential look at the 10-year plan due to this Warner Brothers Discovery merger, and so Jim and I had like our own discussion about what we would like to see out of a 10-year plan. And what kind of things we want to see protected, what kind of things that we think have been working, what things do we think have not, and where we'd ultimately like to see things go. And it led to some interesting debates and conversation about that. We also share a a wide variety of DC news. We also shout out a Batman black and white statue that we both recently received, uh, done by longtime friend of the show, Freddie E. Williams II. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Mr. Segulin, what is going on over at DCBService.com? We have the GCPD, the Blue Wall, issue one of six, 50% off, only $199. And we have Gotham City, year one, issue one of six, 40% off, only $299. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com, they always have the deals of the week, and they've got Deathstroke, Inc., Hardcover, Volume 1, The King of the Superheroes, $29.99 regularly, 50% off, only $14.99. They have the Fourth World by Jack Kirby box set. This is a $120 box set that's 50% off, only $60. Commandy, The Last Boy on Earth by Jack Kirby, Volume 1 trade paperback, $40 regularly, $19.99 $19.99 with a 50% off discount. Some great deals. This is a great way to get books and box sets that you may not have even been aware of. That I missed that Fourth World one by Jack Kirby, and I've been liking these new box sets that they've been releasing. And you know how I am a fan of the Fourth World. I don't have this, and that's one I'm going to end up grabbing. So I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. We have a contest that we're currently running through September 3rd. This is your chance to do a spoiler warning. The prizes are going to be first prize, second prize, and third prize. It's going to be a spot on the show and a trade paperback or hardcover at your choice from sponsor of the show, DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. So we're going to let you out of the September previews. uh, Pick what you want to get off of that one. Or something that maybe from InStockTrades.com that is a backstock item that uh, you wanted as well. We're excited to have you on the show for that spot. We're excited to have you script Jim. You have a choice on this one. You can either call in from our show voicemail line and leave your spoiler warning that way. You can send it to us via email at ragingbullets at gmail.com. Or you can send us your concept. If you're like, "Ah, guys, I don't really want to create it myself, but I would be more than happy to tell Jim what he needs to come up with. (laughs) So they're easy ways to enter. Um, so consider doing it from any of those methods, and uh, we'd love having you part of the show that way. You have until September 3rd to submit them, then we'll start airing them on the show. So I want to thank anybody that's considering participating. Jim, on that note, show them how it's done. Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on today's show. So if you've read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Let's talk some comic book news. Nice work, Adam. What are these characters up to? So, Jim, one of the big things that's been a discussion point lately has been this 10-year plan for and what Discovery, HBO Max kind of combining together means. And, you know, as a fan, I think what we get concerned about is the content that we're already enjoying The stuff that's been announced that we got excited about, what its fate is, like the Blue Beetle movie, stuff like that that I'm really excited about. In the wake of Batgirl, you know, it seems like we're hearing more cancellations than we're hearing new announcements, if that makes any sense. Uh, I'm curious about new updates and things. I don't want to see things that were potentially exciting 
thrown to the wayside. It's not uncommon that movies get rebooted, right? Or, I'm sorry, rebooted is not the right word. Scripts get reworked because something wasn't working or, you know, there's drastic changes. Sometimes those are for the better. Sometimes they're for the worse. Sometimes you get two different things that people feel, you know, either they liked both. Uh, The Justice League movie is a great example of that. When you and I had a discussion about the two different versions of them, um, I think we were both we were both kind of in different places as far as which version we liked more, why, and what, what it was that we were looking. And that's there's nothing wrong with that. It just shows that you know maybe there's things that worked and didn't work about both versions of that film. If for a ten year plan for DC, what I'm looking for out of it is more content, more announcements, more experiments. I don't need them to follow the Marvel plan, which. I'm fine if they find a way to do something similar to that. That's great, as long as it doesn't look like a watered-down version of that. It looks like a a focused, well-developed, DC-related version of that. I'm cool with that. But there's been a lot of movies that, like Joker's a great example, they don't fit into any form of continuity, nor do they need to. <laughs> right. And I'm fine with them continuing to do stuff like that. The Batman, if it's part of a larger DC universe or not, I don't really care. I really enjoyed that film for what they were doing with it. So I'm fine with that. What I'd like to see in the 10-year plan is, like, I'd like to see a Superman movie. I want to see more Wonder Woman. Uh, I want to see more Aquaman. I, you know, the things that are working right now. I'm insane. I mean, The Flash is a whole separate topic we need to talk about right now because what a mess that situation is. But I've heard good things about the film, so I want to see the film. And that's, you know, and I got, let, let me, let's, let's just, ju- can we jump in and talk about The Flash just yeah. really quick as a sidebar seeing as I'm there because rather than just dismiss what I'm saying right now. So there's a lot of controversy with Ezra Miller. The way I look at that is there are a lot of people involved in making a film. You know, yes, it's the lead actor. So I'm not excusing anything. There's a lot of allegations out there with him. There's a lot of crazy behavior out there. Admittedly, I don't, I haven't dived deep into it that I know every little thing. I get it. He, that's a serious black mark on that film when you're dealing with that. But there are a lot of people that go in and a lot of investment that goes into making a film like that. So I hope this film sees the light of day because now I've seen articles recently talking about, well, there's a possibility now that the, you know, the controversy is getting to be so big that maybe they won't release this. I hope that this movie sees the light of day just because I'm excited to see the film. I'm guessing we won't get a Flash 2 with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, honestly, I think... I think they're going to release the film. I hope so. But then Flash 2 will be recasted. Sure. And if they're smart, what they'll do is we're releasing it and then announce we're recasting for Flash 2. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and when when the first movie comes out, that's when they flat out say it. I think mm-hmm. that'd be their safest bet. Well, their safest bet is not do anything and just it disappears. You know, and or, they or, or wait. they recast them for the next Justice League or any time they want a Flash appearance, they do a new actor and that's how they do it. And there's never a Flash movie. That's the safest bet, which I'm worried is actually going to be what Hollywood is going to do because they sometimes do the absolute safest way to you know any type of controversy. Let's avoid it because you know there's too much out there. And again. Like you, I don't know everything that's going on with this guy. I know the basic stuff of it, and I'll be, I don't even have enough to – I don't think I have enough information for me personally to be comfortable to comp, comp, uh, comment on what should happen to him because I don't have enough details. So let's go off of the, the theory that it's, it's, it's the highest de- level of DEF CON. This is a problem, and I don't know. So, But let's say you have to do something with regards to him. End credits. You have a scene where it's a multiverse film. Do something timey-wimey where you chase face changes. (laughs) They do a Doctor Who kind of thing. That's what I mean. I mean, you could do something like that. They 100% could do that. Yes. And then then you move along. Uh, Because I've heard the film's pretty good. And that's why I want to see it. Because at least from what they're saying with um, some articles that I've read about the tracking of the film currently, people seem to like it. As a fan, I want to see it because a lot of, like I said, take Ezra Miller out of it. 
there's a lot of people that have been involved in the making of this film. Writers, uh, directors, you know, people behind the scene in productions, the other cast members. <laughs> you know, let's protect some of those people and, and make that movie see the light of the day. I'm very sad about Batgirl just because I'm worried that it maybe was a film that I would have liked. Yeah. And that we're not going to get a chance to enjoy the work of the people involved in that. I always like seeing the work, especially when it's that far along. So I hope his antics and what's going on. And again, I, I don't know everything. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in innocent till proven guilty. But so much stuff has come out right now. I'm thinking he's in some trouble. And I just I tend to then jump to. Okay, put him in a bubble. Totally respect any, you know, that if he's done some multiple things wrong, that there should be some action taken with regards to that. But you've got to also protect the rest of the cast, the writers, all the people behind the scenes. There's a lot that goes into making a film. It's not one person. So you have to take that into consideration in these situations. And I want to see this movie for the sake of all the people that have invested in the thing. That's And there's a selfish fan part of me, too, that, like, I want to see the story. There is a story that was crafted for, you know, me to enjoy. <laughs> and I want to see that story. It's sad that these type of things overshadow that. Jumping back to the DC Universe. So let's talk about the DC Universe, the universe of films that was being built, right? With Aquaman, Wonder Woman, it spun out of, you know, the Superman, Batman films that were then leading to the Justice League, then were leading to what looked to us as fans as a potential answer to Marvel, right? This DCEU that we've been following all along. One of the big articles I was just reading, it was on our Facebook group, was uh, you know Aquaman, The Flash, Shazam, and Black Adam. It's part of this 10-year plan. Are, they, are really going to determine the DCEU's fate? Um, if they're determining the fate, take The Flash out of it, there's three films right there that I am pretty. Sh I have a lot of confidence in right. being really strong movies. Aquaman's going to be great. Black Adam's going to be great. Shazam's going to be great. And I'm saying that just based on the fact that the initial offerings of both Aquaman and Shazam were fantastic. Black Adam was fantastic. I get the Flash being like a question mark in this whole thing right now. But I would also throw in there Wonder Woman is a determining factor of that fate. And we've had two really successful films of that. So I'm hoping that continues, morphs. With the multiverse and the way DC works, I, I don't know that you need to reboot any of that in order to continue to morph this into one larger tapestry. Comics work that way. I mean, how many times has continuity just changed and we've moved along? <laughs> right. You know, so I think you can do that with the films as well. But I'm... The the actors that are in Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Shazam, Black Adam. Uh, well, Black Adam, I'm putting you know I'm jump I'm cart before the horse in the sense that I haven't seen the film yet, but based on the trailers alone, I'm feeling very protective of that movie. I want to see all those properties continue with the people involved who have been delivering such amazing work for us, because those have been stellar. So I don't if there's a question mark on any of that. I don't know why. Yeah, I, I it, there's that one meme that's out there where they took um, from uh, Watchmen with uh, with him sitting on Mars. You know, he's sitting on you know sitting on Mars. You know, it's 1988. DC has a 10 year plan. It's 1990. DC has a 10 year plan, and they keep going through <laughs> all the years where they keep saying they have a 10 year plan. Yeah. You know, and I, I chuckle every time I see the meme. I'm like, yes, that's true. And, you know, it makes me laugh. But you know, for me, a 10 year plan. It doesn't have to be as laid out and as interlocked as Marvel. Marvel's doing a great job with that. That's awesome. Rock yep. and roll, guys. Agreed. I just want a plan. I just want regular movies. I want movies that build on each other. Like, and we started to get that because we had you know, the Batman versus Superman. Then we had the Justice League. We've got the Aquaman. We've got Wonder Woman. We've got you know the Flash movie was coming out. There was all the rumor talk. Maybe we'd get a cyborg movie out of it. I was like, this is cool. That's the kind of stuff that I just wanted. And then it's like, no, that's gone. That's gone. And then this, the hatchet job just starts going through. And you know, as we said, everything unknown with the Flash. And even Aquaman had Aquaman movies coming out. But they cut Mira out of the movie. And Mira was a cool character. Right. You know, and I understand, again, I understand why they did what they're doing. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, you know, hurt the movie. But that's a character that I would like to see. 
I would I would have no problem with them recasting. Just like again, as I said with the Flash, you mm-hmm. know, they could he I loved him as the Flash. I thought he was a great character. I loved the original uh, the original movie version, and then you know the you know the bar black and white version. I, you know all of that. Just the extra footage made me want him want a Flash movie more. All those extra footage. So I was like, I really liked him as the Flash. But here's the thing. I'm not going to say he must be the Flash. No, recast him. If Wait. he got issues, recast him. Continue the story going. They did you it know? in the Nolan films, right? They recast Katie Holmes's character, who is who is a pivotal character. The yeah. relationship between her and Bruce was something that played oh so heavily into the Dark Knight with the yeah. Joker and the way the whole Two Face scenario played out. If you did not have that character and the belief in the relationship, but yet the recasting worked. Um, yes, completely different actress, and yet she she brought the role to life and made you believe that she was the same character, even though, yes, there were differences in the portrayal because of the fact that it's a different actress interpreting the character, but she did a great job, I, I, that's, and it's a hard thing to do. So it works, and you know that's something, if you need to recast, you need to recast, you need to do what's best for the film. To me, it should be the story of the film that drives your decisions, and if you need to recast, recast. Here's the thing, as fans, obviously... I would, it's like a different artist taking over, correct? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, where the, the characters look slightly different, there's a different uh, tone, um, it's brought to life. Eventually, you, you just kind of get into the groove, and, and they're a good storyteller. If you've cast well when you recast, a good storyteller will take you through and, and make it work. So, you know, that's something that you need to do sometimes, and it's okay to recast a film and, and get that ball rolling that way. So, you know, I hope that. I hope that they do what's best for story. I think you're nailing something um, in, in talking about the Marvel piece. I would like us eventually, to, and I don't know that there's ever going to be a way to get completely away from it, but I think we've got to stop looking at the Marvel model and trying to say that DC, we need to see DC's version of that. No. And the reason why is what Marvel did was brilliant. And it took so much longer than we're saying for that to be a thing. Marvel had done this as a big plan. I mean, you look you can look historically at how long it took for that to be a thing. Uh, and I remember ages ago when Marvel was kind of branching out as a company, Marvel Studios was becoming a thing. That was after Spider, you know, it was it was during the time Spider-Man was being made by Sony and the X-Men films were being made by Fox. Fantastic Four was being made by Fox. There was all these talks of, like, Marvel doing their own films and, you know, developing their own studio. What they did was brilliant. I don't know that you can or should try to replicate that because it's. I, I still say it's going to come off as a watered-down version of that. I just want good movies. Just make good movies. And I don't care if it's in a 10-year plan. It's a focus on that versus trying to rush to compete with a company that's already they you, you're not going to compete with that juggernaut they've they've had somebody at the helm who's really worked out a formula that has become like a machine and it's the way that they've interwoven tv and film has uh, been something that is amazing and i love what they do just as much though DC TV, and we forget to talk about this, DC TV has been phenomenal in the amount of successful shows that they've put out. And I would make a strong argument that DC's been nailing it in TV in a way, I don't want to say that Marvel hasn't. Marvel's done a lot of different things with television that have been highly successful, but certainly not on the scope and scale of these 22-episode season shows that DC was putting out through Warner. That relationship with the CW... Whether you're a fan of those shows or not, you have to admire the fact that that was the Arrowverse um, that was created and put out there is something that, my gosh, look how long Arrow ran. Look how long The Flash has run. The Flash is just coming to an end right now. It's season nine, I believe, is the truncated season. That's an impressive run for this universe. I don't know how much longer it's going to extend beyond then because we're, we're seeing the new generation of shows that have been running concurrently. We've seen some shows like Legends Tomorrow and stuff like that come to an end in this process, Batwoman come to an end. 
um, shows that I've really dug. But there's Lois and Clark. There's other shows that are continuing. And I think it's really great what DC's doing with TV. There's been a lot of success that sometimes we choose not to acknowledge in this process. Um, there's been great movies out there. I, and I, one movie I want to shout out that came up on our Facebook group recently, and, and I had a couple friends of mine reference that they'd seen it. That Crypto and Ace, that DC Super Pets movie that just came out, was really great. It was up there with the Pixar movies. It was up there with what we see from Illuminations. Um, it really was a well-put-together movie with a great voice cast and a, and a really fun story that I, it targets a different audience. And I think it's really great that we're seeing that kind of stuff. So in their 10-year plan, I think what they need to embrace is what's been working. Take a look at what hasn't. I mean, movies like Joker and The Batman and, and you know the, the movies from the DCEU that we've liked have been successes. There's this kind of weird thing that we do at DC. We act like they're somehow behind the eight ball and they haven't been developing great content. I would make an argument like, are you kidding? We've gotten a lot. <laughs> a lot more than I think we choose to acknowledge. If you compare hours of content, I don't know that we're actually behind <laughs> in what we've gotten. When you if you if you add TV into the mix, I think DC might actually have more content that they've put out in that time frame than Marvel has. And that's not a trying to beat Marvel. Uh, I think we've gotten a lot of incredible... My problem right now is there's too much incredible superhero content because we're just talking about the properties that have been put out for DC and Marvel, not the rest of it. Dude, we just got Sandman. Did you see any yep. of Sandman? I haven't watched Sandman yet, no. Oh, it is so good. And I, my wife watched the first episode with me. Um, she came down partway through because she kind of wasn't interested, but then came down partway through and she's like, that was really good. And... I mean, I don't know if she's intended to watch the rest with me or not. I've actually held off on episode two to see if she wants to watch it because we've been watching Stranger Things on Netflix together. Um, but if she doesn't, I'm happy to continue on watching it. But at least for somebody who is a non-fan, knows nothing about Sandman, she walked in blind and the first episode was drawn in. And there's like some 80-something countries that it is the top show right now on Netflix. That's that bodes very well for that series going forward. It's really the first episode was the first issue of the comic with some adaptations because of some changes that they made that I thought were welcome changes for television. So it it was really it felt so good and the casting is phenomenal. Not just Dream, everybody was really well cast and I'm excited to continue watching more of this really good stuff. So, I mean, I don't know what what do we what more do we want? <laughs> I just don't, I guess that's what I'm asking. Do you feel like you're like like there's content missing? I guess that's the piece where I see a lot of stuff like out there like implying that DC needs to get on the ball. And when I say DC, they're talking about Warner proper, Warner, you know, HBO, Discovery, Max Discovery, and all that kinds of stuff like that. I'm concerned about the cutting of stuff because I wanted to see all of it, but I do feel like I'm getting a lot of content. The animated movies, I've completely glossed over. The fact that we get these direct-to-animation releases that are stellar, too. I guess my question to you is, what do you, and I'm, maybe you see it differently than I do in respect, what do you feel we're not getting? I'll be honest, I think it doesn't look like they have a concrete plan. It mm -hmm. doesn't look like there's something laid out where this movie built on this movie, this movie built on this movie. It seems like more like just a hodgepodge of, we've got all these cool characters, here they are. Yeah. Now, yeah. you think about it. Comic books themselves, a lot of times, are we've got a lot of cool characters here. These are stories, you know. So in the, the actual when you're reading comic books, a lot of times you don't have it. Where the Marvel movies always seem like it's an event, you know. And each of these characters are, you know, it's their dealings with the event. They're dealing, you know, like their, the, you know, their individual movie, you know, will have direct reference. Like the the Captain America movies had direct references to, you know, the Avenger movies and the, the one Iron Man movie where he was dealing with his PTSD after dealing with the alien invasion. It was that direct buildup. So it was an Iron Man movie. So it's like the Iron Man comic book, but there's the after effect of the big event that happened. That's the kind of stuff that we don't get sure. or I don't feel we get in the DC movies. And Fair. they started having a glimmer of it 
you know, with the the bat, you know, with the Batman. Then they had the Batman versus Superman. They had that Superman, you know, the connection with the Superman. Then Wonder Woman, and then just everything with the Avengers. And it's a, it was starting to play off. Like okay, it started, feeling, and then everything just gets derailed. Does it? And have- now it's back to being. We've got cool movies, but they're not. They don't feel like you know it's part of the same universe. Do they have to be? Well, and I'm not, and that's not an argument. Okay. I get so here's let me let me throw this piece out there before you answer my question because uh, let me give you some of my thoughts on what you just said because I'll actually concede to everything you just said and agree. Um, I I think sometimes we see some organic connections between the films that feel good and they get you excited and pumped up, and I totally agree with that. And there's other times where it almost feels like it's tacked on and forced, and it's. Like, it gets you excited because you're like, oh, cool, more movies, but it's kind of like, <laughs> that doesn't feel, doesn't really feel connected at all. And that's okay. You know, I guess it's kind of a thing. It fe- That almost feels like they're weakly trying to make it like what Marvel's doing. Um, where my question's going is, do these movies, uh, and does the TV, does all of this need to be interconnected? You know, can can we do the DC multiverse thing where we can say that's just happening on another Earth? Because uh, to me, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to re- tip my hat and say, instead of setting up that answer and responding to you, I'm going to tip my hat and say, I'm as long as it's good, I'm fine with them doing any of that, and maybe not forcing connections where they don't be- like connecting small movies where Aquaman and Wonder Woman that well they've been on screen together, so yes, their universe should be connected. The Ben Affleck Batman, and now with the Flash and what you know. I want to see that film and maybe how it interconnects a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe it explains the multiverse in a cool way where we can do more of that. And I guess that the different release of the flash and Aquaman now has changed some scenes in Aquaman where Mike, I guess Michael Keaton's Batman was supposed to appear in the second Aquaman movie, but I guess now maybe can't because the scene doesn't make any sense because flash hasn't come out. You know, the shifting of the orders. And that happened to Doctor Strange, I think, and um, Spider-Man. I think something happened there as well, where there were scenes that that didn't make sense in Spider-Man. Because um, Doctor Strange was supposed to come out first. And please know I'm shooting this off the cuff, so if I'm off on any of this, this is, you know, things that I I thought I remembered reading. I'm I'm not saying I'm rock solid on that. But obviously, here's what's going to be obvious. If you're changing the release order of these movies, and that's where the Marvel model usually works really well, they know this film comes next, this TV show comes next, this comes next. They know this overwhelming tapestry, I'm not overwhelming, I mean this overarching tapestry is a better way to put it, an overarching strong tapestry that they know if we don't release this show here, there's a problem for this movie here. If we don't release this movie here, there's a problem for the next movie because we have end credit scenes. We have scenes that happen partway through the film that are little teases that are meant to get your mind thinking about what will come next. That works extremely well. I'm not at all against DC doing that, but to the point, I guess, of what you're saying, if they don't have a plan for that, Just develop good movies. Get people having faith and confidence and excitement in these characters, I guess is my thought. Develop films that people are going to want to go see. And if there's a point in time to cross them over, great. Just go ahead and do that. Like, you don't necessarily need to have the films that came before with this deep interwoven tapestry. If you're doing a great Green Lantern movie and a great Superman movie, and then you eventually pair them up, People will go to see that pair-up movie because they liked the two movies that came before. It isn't because you had an end credits scene that happened to connect those two films. I don't believe that. I think it works extremely well in the Marvel model, and I love it. So that's not me dismissing it or diminishing what they do over in that model. But if you don't have that model in place, how about focusing first on just making sure you continue to develop and deliver great movies and that will bring people to the movie theaters and they will go to see more of your films. I just think that's that's how film works. We don't go to the movies for the end credit scenes. I love them. They're great bonuses. They're fan service. They do exactly what they're supposed to do. But if you don't have something solid, don't put them in just because Marvel does it, I guess is what I'm saying. 
Because then you get what you're talking about here, where it feels like it's not planned. (laughs) (laughs) So then just embrace that it's not, and just deliver great films. Let creators, creative, create and develop great films with your properties. Connect the ones that need to be connected and, and don't don't with the ones that don't. The Batman, I did not need an end credit scene connecting it to previous Superman movies or something like that. I needed the Batman to be what it was, which I thought it was a great movie and one of the first movies that I thought represented detective comics. And I liked that it felt so different than the other Batman movies that were out there. I did not need an end credit scene that had Jason Momoa in it, who I love, by the way, to somehow go, wow, this is connected to Aquaman? I don't, there was no need for that, no point for that. I wanted scenes that made me go, there's going to be a sequel? Yes! (laughs) That's what I wanted out of the Batman. Yeah, and I agree with you. It doesn't need to be, you know, you know, it doesn't need to have that, you know, to one to be to see and all that, because as long as you give me some solid movies, I'm happy with it. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to give me solid movies, you got to keep regularly producing these solid movies. Yes. That needs to be the 10 year plan. You know, if if like, for example, when was the last time we had a, a Superman? movie? No you know? kidding. <laughs> you know? Why don't we have. And here's the thing. Do a Superman movie. If you do a standalone Superman movie, okay. I would prefer the Superman that we've been seeing and actually have, you know, Superman, Wonder Woman, and uh, Batman in it Mm -hmm. and have it be who, you know, you know, have it be Affleck, have it be Gal Gadot, and, you know, have it be our Superman. Let's keep these guys together. Let's keep that team together. Do they, and even if you do a Trinity movie, and if you don't want to just do a Superman movie, cool. Or if a Trinity movie may end up being too much money because it's three very large paychecks, you know, fine. Then you do a Superman movie. But that's something I wish we'd get, you know, is like another Superman movie. That's the kind of thing for me what I would like for a 10-year plan. I would like for her set, hey, we got a Superman movie coming out. We've got another Wonder Woman movie coming out. Here's the Batman movie coming out. Here is the Ben Affleck Batman movie, you know. And you can run two different Batman. You can run Ben Affleck Batman yeah. and you can run, you know, the Batman and do that second movie, which, you know, they teased the Joker. Come on. You got to give that to us. I, I 100% want that movie. I'd like to see them try it. Here's the thing. I, I think what you're saying is, is something interesting. There's all this thing where it gets confusing for people and stuff like that. How about just releasing one? Like do a Ben Affleck movie, you know, a standalone Ben Affleck movie. And, Let's see. Is there interest? Would people... I mean, I know that... And believe me, I know that these are big budget and they're expensive and things like that, so I'm not making light of that. I'm saying if you've got a good story and you've got a really strong script with an older Batman, why not release that and let's see. Does it track well? Do people like it? Um, it's, it's an interesting sort of, you know, experiment. Instead of the assumption, because that's the problem I have, there's this crazy assumption that people are somehow stupid and can't you know, take different versions of the characters. That was, that came up with the Flash. Remember the Flash TV show and the Flash movie? There was that question of, you know, can we have both and that type of thing? Why? Why Why is that a question? Um, I don't know if it's good and well done and you put it out. I mean, we haven't, here's the thing. That experiment hasn't paid off yet. And here's the hard part about that. I don't know that this Flash film is going to be a good measuring stick of that because here's the problem with controversy, as we well know. People eventually get sick of the controversy, and that affects a film, which I get the problem right now. So now they've got this film that is more surrounded by controversy than it's a good movie. I hear it's tracking well, which is great, but the big story is Ezra Miller's screwing up. Right or wrong, however you feel about that, I get, you know, it sounds like I'm contradicting myself, but I do understand the conundrum. I understand the problem. I'm I'm a reasonable person when it comes to stuff like that so i guess here's the problem let's go to something else ben affleck is batman yeah there's been some you know you and i both really enjoy ben affleck as batman we're on the same page i like batfleck i always have and and i don't say that as a negative i know some people use that as a negative term i really like him as batman uh, I would love to see a standalone movie with him. I don't. He hasn't had that opportunity. I wanted to see that film because I think truly that may have corrected some of the problem. 
because we got to see him in Superman Batman where he was portrayed as a bad guy in that, you know, let's be honest, it was Batman v Superman and he was portrayed as wrong in that, right? And then eventually changed his tune and Superman and him got together. They were being pitted against each other by Lex Luthor. We didn't really get to see that build to where it was logically going to go. We saw it in Justice League, but there was more to be done there, right? And we didn't get to see that progression of storyline. So I don't know that necessarily Ben Affleck's Batman might be the right test of that, but I certainly think there's a point in trying a, a film with a different Batman to see how it tracks. How to- what? We're going to see him in the Aquaman movie. Yes. So that'll be, that would be kind of a test market. And I'll be honest with you, I would love to see, you know, a world's finest movie where, cause we had the intro of them where they were fighting. We had the justice league where they did work together. And then at the end of the movie, they started having that association friendship. We could do a third movie where it is Batman and super. Can I, you know, can I both say them as heroes? Here's what I'd like to see though. I'd like to see a true... So, yeah, wait, first of all, let me say, I want to see the film you just said. So, I agree with you. Let me, let's put that in its own bubble. And I go, yes, World's Finest Movie sounds fantastic. Can I say... What, you said something earlier that I want to go back to. I want to see another Superman movie. I don't want to see a Trinity... I, I, I don't want to say... I, w- I would love to see a Trinity movie. Yeah. But I would... That's a Trinity movie. I, I, would I love to see a World's Finest movie? Sure. But that's a World's Finest movie. I want to see a second Superman movie. We have not seen that. Right. Batman v Superman was a, I don't want to say it was a world's finest movie. It was a movie that pitted Batman against Superman. It was not Superman 2. I would love to see Man of Steel 2. I would love to see a true follow-up to Man of Steel where we get a Superman story where it isn't about bogging it down with supporting cast. And when I say bogging it down with supporting cast, I'd like to see a story that focuses more on him and Lois, that focuses on Jimmy, that focuses on Perry, that focuses on, you know, the, his mom and, and the farm and, and you know, all the stuff that, like, em, you, we embrace in Superman's world and not having to then focus on Gotham and focus on Themyscira and focus on all those. I want to see the Trinity movie that you're talking about. So it sounds like I'm disputing you. I'm not. I want to put those in a bubble and go, I completely agree with everything you just said. But I also want to go back to, I think, where you first started with this and something that I thought was something I was nodding to and I said yes immediately to. I want to see another Superman movie. I want to see another Superman movie. Wonder Woman 2 was not about having Batman in it. It was not about having Superman in it. It was not about having the Flash in it. It was a great Wonder Woman follow-up. And I want to see a Wonder Woman 3 that is a great Wonder Woman follow-up. You, if, you, if there's a reason to put another hero in it, a la what Thor Ragnarok did with the Hulk, terrific. I love that kind of stuff. I do want to see that. I'm, I geek out at that kind of junk. It's when it's the story, it's story-driven, sure, go ahead and do it. But I would love, and I think it's important to, if you want to establish a love for Henry Cavill's Superman, I think you need to develop his story a little bit more. Get that character out there and let us embrace Superman. You know, that's what I I would love to see another Superman movie. And on top of, here's the thing, you and I are laying out a pretty good 10-year plan here right now. I would mind in that process a, a Trinity movie in there too. A world's finest movie in there too, one hundred percent, all well produced and all that. But can you please give me a Superman movie, a real Superman movie in there as well? Yeah, you know, here's one of the things I was thinking because as you're talking, it just popped in my head. You have a Superman, a pure Superman movie where mm-hmm. it's just Superman. It's you know, one. I'd love to see him explain how he explains Clark Kent coming back from the dead without revealing his secret identity. Yeah, you know that little stuff like that. I mean, stories about him and Lois and those that tease of maybe Lois was you know pregnant and just and all that was kind of possibility of stories they could have gone with. A uh, pursue all those stories. The end credit for it is either Diana or Bruce showing up saying, "I need your help." You know, and then they go to the Batman movie where it's yeah. a pure Batman movie. And at the end of the movie is him going to Superman for help. You know, and then you have either a Wonder Woman 3 where it's a pure Wonder Woman movie. Then at the end, it's the two of them showing up, Diana, 
we need your help. And then they, you have the next movie is a Trinity movie. So yeah. each one of them has their own individual movie where the end credit scene is the exact same scene of them building up, planning for this Trinity movie that's coming. And then here's the thing. That for me is a 10-year plan. If you've got that tapestry in place, if not, and, and, and this is, I'm not disputing you because actually I'm nodding at everything you're saying and going yes, but let's go with plan B too. So plan A is that. So yes to everything you just said and great plan. So I'm agreeing with you. But if they don't have that, do another Wonder Woman movie and have, have it be just a great Wonder Woman movie that leads into the next Wonder Woman movie. That's okay to do. Yes, 100%. Okay. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, here's the thing. when I, At the end of the Wonder Woman movie, the last one, I was glad to see we're getting more of that. Like, yes, please, because that's working. So give me more of that. I didn't need to see another hero in that. I needed to see the Wonder Woman movie continue on in that Wonder Woman universe. That's okay. Like, there's nothing wrong with doing that and developing a really strong series of Wonder Woman films. And to your point, when you get to that point where you've got that plan well produced, then you throw that in there. Maybe it's Wonder Woman 4 that you do that. Maybe it's not Wonder Woman 3. You know, I don't care when that happens. So I think your plan A can manifest itself somewhere along the way. I don't think right, at least everything I'm seeing right now with cancellations and all that kind of stuff, we're in the early stages of them planning a 10-year plan. So how about in that process, let's embrace what's working right now. Little less announcements about cancellations and more. What's coming up? (laughs) Let's get excited about those pieces. I don't need them to tell me that there's going to be a Trinity movie and a World's Finest movie if they don't have those in place yet, if they don't have a plan for those. Because the problem is, you start making those announcements and then they don't pay off, and you lead to cancellations, that's where you, you're you making some big mistakes and people are losing confidence. That graphic that Marvel put up, I'm really sure all of those movies are going to be made. <laughs> and that's something that's great. Uh, I heard rumblings now, I thought I saw somewhere that there's going to be an Eternals 2, which I'm shocked by, because I thought that one was one that maybe didn't do as well as they were expecting, and I liked the Eternals, so I'm excited for that announcement, by the way, to be clear, if that's truly a thing. If that's formally announced, and maybe it has been, I'm very confident that movie's actually going to be made. That's something these cancellations are not going to get people excited for. They're going to get people looking, continuing to look at this universe as a this series of films as a joke, and it, it makes you look like the Keystone Cops. Canceling Batgirl was a big that hurts. It, that hurt big time. Yeah. Whether whether it should be or not, let's let's go back and say let's say they're a hundred percent correct. Let's just say that movie was a mess, and I'm not. That's not me insulting anybody who created this film. Let's I'm going to the extreme, right? Let's so let's go. Let's say this movie was a there they were right to do it and it was a mess. Even so, that looks bad. You know, that that kind of controversy is stuff that has marred the universe. Look what happened with Justice League did not was not a good look. You know, any way you look at it, it there's there was, yeah, then there was yeah. then there was controversy behind the working conditions on that film. Um there was a lot that like was, you know, on the reshoots I'm talking about, uh, that right or wrong, you know, whether they're true or not, it's a bad look. So I, I don't know. I'm just excited for new films. The Joker two. When I hear about that, you know, what's great about the Joker two? There's not a lot of nonsense yeah. with the Joker two. You like hear one announcement after the other. You hear that certain cast members, like it's on our Facebook group. You know, we got cast members that are returning. That kind of stuff. It's like fun to read about the Joker. Because, like, everything is another announcement of where this unique exploration of the concept of the Joker is going. And that's something that I think the Joker film's doing really well. They're just crafting a really good movie that is a surprise. The Joker was a complete surprise. The sequel, I'm sure, is going to be equally a great... Which is hard to do, right? Because we've already seen what the Joker was. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought that movie was pretty done at the end. The idea that they're doing a sequel and everything that I've heard so far, you know, that we've read the same things, I'm sure, it's like going like, okay, they're giving me another film that's going to be like a completely different direction for this kind of character. And and I'm super excited for that. 
So it's fun to rally behind that. Black Adam, you're not hearing a lot of nonsense behind it. It took a long time to get to this point, but I feel that's one, because there's not a lot of nonsense stories behind the scenes with that one, I feel like it just took a long time because they were trying to develop a great film, and we're going to get a great film. (laughs) Yes. So I'm okay with that. Shazam, no nonsense behind it. It's just being moved around, I think, to place it well. So that way they can do some of what you were concerned about in some of our previous episodes. I think they're going to try to get some promotion going for that thing. Great. Um, The Flash is the only one I'm really worried about of that batch. I'm not worried about Aqu- uh, the I piece with think Aquaman is going to be okay. I'm. I think so. But I think it's going to be a really good film. Right. My concern about that one is, unfortunately, that Johnny Depp Amber Heard controversy. I hope it doesn't bleed into that one because the first movie was so good, and I love Jason Momoa as Aquaman. Um, I hope that, and this isn't me trying to put a black mark on that film. I'm really not. It's. That's the only other one that I, I think has, ha, unfortunately, has some nonsense tied to it that I hope it distances itself from. Because I think I want to see another, I want to see Aquaman 3. So right. I'm I'm less worried about my enjoyment of Aquaman 2 and more worried about Aquaman 3. I'm hoping that Aquaman 2 naturally leads to an Aquaman 3, whether it's with M- Mira being the same actress or not. Uh, I liked her in the first movie, so I'm not against it. I I think there's a point in time where you have to take a look at... There's serious relationship problems with her and Johnny Depp. I got to admit that I've watched or, you know, read about some of it. And, you know, I've flip-flopped as far as who I would finger point at in that one. At the end of the day, I don't... Like, what's going on in their marriage, like... If he was wrong, I hope that he gets the smacking he deserves. If she's wrong, I hope she gets the smacking she deserves. I don't want a film that involves a ton of people to be a victim of either of them getting a smacking they deserve for their personal life. Because that film puts food on the table for a lot of people that are involved. And it offers a lot of enjoyment to a lot of people to have a singleton person derail it or a singleton situation derail it what the thing is if she's a victim in this scenario and i I say that with respect i don't i don't pretend to know every little detail about all of that i don't feel like her career should be negatively impacted if she's the victim in this thing if she's not and it's the other way around and she's potentially a guilty party in that season please know again i'm saying that with respect again that should not impact the wealth of other people that are involved in that process. You know, their relationship should not derail what is potentially, could potentially hurt a lot of people. And I feel very strongly about that because, you know, that's, this is, these are people's livelihoods that are out there and good stories that we could potentially enjoy as fans that shouldn't be derailed because of a singleton person. I, I, that's something that needs to be, there needs to be some correction to this because that. That's the thing. And the Fla- I think The Flash is a great example of this right now. Where I, there's a film that's tracking really well, which means there's a lot of creative that's been involved in doing that. And if Ezra Miller's wrong, and if, let's throw the book at him for those pieces, the solution I'd like to see out of that is, then you recast. Put that film out and recast. And embrace what worked. And... At the end, you need to say, we can't have you be the face of this franchise moving forward. That's okay. I can get behind that. Mira, same thing. If yeah. she's if she's wrong in some way, and that's truly determined, truly determined, then recast. If she's not, then let's move on and put her in the film and be done with it. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I can move along. Let's stop having these controversies drive what could potentially hurt a lot of people and good stories from being put on the screen. Because I think that's what's happening. Uh, The Green Lantern show. Now, I keep hearing, I see rumors that that's on. I hear see rumors that's off. On, then off. I want to see the Green Lantern Corps show in the worst way. I'm hoping that survives the axe. That, you know, even if it's not ready for primetime, how can you be like, 
trying to restructure and do a 10-year plan and, and go, hey, this Green Lantern show idea, I think it's a bad idea. Let's not do that. Make it work. <laughs> yes. If it's not ready for prime time, then take that plan back to the drawing board, but make it work. You know, the have our you know build our confidence in just delivering a good product. Strange Adventures being canceled that is a biggie for me. I thought that was going to be super cool, and I'm glad I'm sad to see that one is taken off the. Um, I don't know if that one was on your radar at all, but a Kevin Smith run Strange Adventure show was something I was super excited <laughs> for because it's different, right? Uh, I looked at that as kind of like another Doom Patrol. Yeah. And I don't mean that it was going to be Doom Patrol, but I mean, like... No, I hear you, and I agree with you. It, it's something that, I'll be honest, I didn't really know it was, it was out there until I heard, until I saw the cancellation. Like, oh, I didn't know that was out there. That would have been cool. <laughs> There's a Dark uh, Constantine reboot that looks like, at least so far, that's going to be safe, um, which I love the idea of more Constantine. Um, that's something that's going to be cool. As we continue to go on, I'm just going through some of the news there because I do want to talk about some of the other things. And I'm sure we'll get, I'm sure some of the news is going to lead us back to talking about this because it's a hot topic right now. But um, Kal El returning to Earth is going to be a Dark Crisis tie in. It's going to lead us right up to Dark Crisis, uh, which I'm excited now to start seeing some of these books align with what you and I are reading in Dark Crisis. Uh, I'm, I'm at the point where. I'm, I like the way they're doing it, right? Where it, it wasn't day and date that all of a sudden the monthly titles were lined up. We kept getting stories with our favorite characters. And eventually these books are going to say, this is where Dark Crisis happened. I, I don't want them to awkwardly end their story arcs or force the ending of their story arcs. Because the stuff that's been going on in the, in the action comics and um, you know the, the um, John Kent title have been really strong. I really enjoy those books. So let those stories go where they need to go. Tell me when Dark Crisis happens by organically taking me there. So I'm excited for that story to continue. There's a, a Superman Kal-El Returns special that's coming, an upcoming one-shot that's going to be a part of that. And are you, you've you got to be enjoying Action Comics and the Superman Man of Tomorrow as much as I am. I am so loving that. <laughs> I am absolutely thrilled with how, with the story being played out in action, just everything that's going on. I am so you know excited for it. I'm loving John as Superman. So it's uh, you know it's as they're building towards Kal El's return, you can kind of I kind of see how it's going to play out, and I'm really seeing understanding where you know Dark Crisis is fitting in with his universe, which means I'm understanding where it's going to probably fit in with John's universe. I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm seeing this kind of, you know, how this is playing out. And I've got a theory in my head where, well, my theory is simple. I think Clark is going to finish up all his stuff at War World, get back to full power, and then before he physically arrives, before Lois and John see him, is when he's going to get pulled into um, – the uh, Dark Crisis. Mm. And they're going to show that. So I think, because I don't think John or Lois are ever going to get to see him come back for a moral world. Really? Yeah. It, I'm not contradicting. I, I would, I think it can work either way. Oh, so 100%. I, I don't have 100%. that. I don't have that kind I of. I got in my head that that's what's going to yeah. happen. Now, I hope your wrong, heads, here's I'm the thing. I hope, I hope your head's wrong because I'd like to see them reconnect. But, I, here's the thing. At the end of the day, a great story is going to get me excited either way. I don't know that I have in my I guess in my mind, I don't have a firm direction for that story. I guess the crossover between Action and Superman Man of Tomorrow had me believing that the two of them were going to reconnect and that we were going to get to see that. But I may be making an assumption there that is completely incorrect. I just want a really good story leading me into Dark Crisis. So I have confidence in this team that they're going to give me that. So when that happens, I, I don't. I guess for me, what ends up happening is I start somewhat zoning out in the sense that just let them take me. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm in that place with of trust and confidence with the creative involved that they're just going to take me there, and I'm really enjoying that. So I don't have this firm kind of feeling that they aren't going to see each other or not. But I don't. You know, you may be right on that one. Cool, uh, as long as it's a great story. And I feel like they're going to give me one. So, 
could, I tr- completely trust this creative team. I do so too. again, I'm in the same boat. It just in my head, that's why I got this. I get this feeling that they're going to play it that way. I hope your head's yeah. wrong, just because I want to see them reconnect. Oh, and I always love those moments. So yeah, I want to see it too. I want to see you know. You know I, one of my favorite scenes, still to this day, um, is w- after the death of Superman. Where Lois, because throughout, you know, after he's died, after dealing with all the other Superman, there's always that bird that kept tapping on her window. And she'd throw open the curtain, hoping to see Clark, and it's not up with it. And finally, the one, she's like, that damn bird. And she goes and throws it open, and all you see is the big red ass, you know? And I still, he swoops her up. They fly up into the sky. They plant the big old kiss. I still, to this day, cheer at the thought of reading that scene. Because I love how they did that, where they kept teasing, you know, they kept teasing her, and she finally throws open the curtain and sees just the, they just show the big red ass, like yes, yes, you know. I, I love those moments, and it just him and his son getting together. I think that'll be a great moment, you know. So I want to see those, but the back of my head is thinking that's not going to happen. Yeah, I don't know. That's uh, I, I don't have a strong feeling either way on that one. I'm excited for the story though, and I think we're that's where we're both in the same place. It's there's an anticipation. I'm anticipating the story, so I don't want to make it look like I'm indifferent. I'm not. I'm just really enjoying so much of what's going on in those books right now that I'm just embracing their their kind of guiding me through. I feel like I'm on a on this like really cool boat ride that they're guiding. And they're like pointing things out along the way, and I'm just kind of like, "Oh, cool! That's neat! That's neat!" And and that's where I'm at with that. It's an interesting sort of ride that I'm going on, uh, and I feel like the creative, both writers that are involved in both respective books, are just doing a really great job at taking me through those stories right now. It's it's a fun time to be a Superman fan. This Superman story is epic, and uh, I I I almost feel like I sometimes diminish John's book because of the fact that the there's those huge events going on in action comics. I love that John's book is so earth grounded and really developed on him embracing the role of Superman, embracing what it's like to try and fill his father's shoes. And I think it's been a really successful run. It reminds me of what I enjoyed about um, the reign of the Superman story back in the day where I was trying, I did not think the story was going to wrap up the way that it did initially. I thought that one of the people that was the respective Superman that were showing up on the scene either was Superman or was part of Superman. And I felt like there was going to be like an amalgamation of maybe two of them connecting and they wound up being Superman at the end. Cyborg in particular was like where my head was going with that until we saw where that went. (laughs) But it was it was just a fun journey, like getting to know that Superboy. And I kind of felt that that Superboy was going to continue on being a Superboy, you know, as a clone. And I'm glad that they did. I steel I thought that there was going to be like hit the heart of Superman was somehow in steel if that made sense so I was speculating during that as well not knowing where the story was going to go this is the fun time with this right now where it's this exploration of John Kent and getting a chance to see that character I think grow farther than he's ever been able to because of the fact that Clark is off on this other adventure right now and I think it's going to do the character well when Clark does eventually return that this character has been very strongly established. I don't know what that means for John Kent in the future, but I'm excited for that future because I've grown to really love the character. On the um, Facebook group, there's a Sandman helmet tutorial that I may actually try. James Williams Stubbs posted this. It's on YouTube. I'm not a... And let me be clear off of this one. I'm not a cosplay guy, not because I don't respect it. I do. I'm just not good at it. I looked at this helmet and it looks sweet. Like it's something where I'd love to create just because of the fact that I would love to display it. And and again, that sounds, I'm not being snarky about cosplay. I think the thing with cosplay for me, and this is respect to people who do cosplay, there's a lot of work that goes into cosplay. A lot of work into bringing that stuff with you. They're often uncomfortable outfits, but yet I always appreciate it. I take pictures of people at conventions that are wearing really cool costumes because I uh, 
I appreciate that, and I love what they bring to the atmosphere of a convention. I don't know that I ever see my. I, it's not that I would never dress up for a convention. I would. I'm not. It's not that kind of. I'm too good for that. It's nothing like that at all. I'm lazy when it comes to that. <laughs> and I really, and I say that with respect because I know the work that goes into that. I want to go to the convention and go to the panels and get the autographs signed and pictures signed. I do feel like, though, I would love to find the time to be able to start crafting stuff like this. And that may be something where then I, I want to show it off. you know. And I, I get that. I, I see how like creating something like this afterwards, you're kind of like, well, I made this. I want people to see this now. And, and uh, so this may be my first foray into creating something. Cause this is, it looks really cool. And it looks like somebody like me could create this. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I'm not that I don't have the history of creating this type of costuming, but I would at least be interested in pursuing that to see if that's a thing. Have you done, are you, are you, have you done any form of costume creation in your life? I mean, has that been a thing that I haven't? So I admit that I'm in the category of if I've done it, it's been like some I've done a joke or something like that. And it's usually been like something very simple that I've put together. Well, you've seen all the stuff I've done because I used to do them for the wrestling. Yes. That we used to do. You know, so I, I but I like that stuff. costuming. It's only very easy stuff. Right, right. <laughs> But, I, but here's the thing. I've liked everything that you've done. I, I would actually make the argument that you're a little more creative at, at it than I am because, I, to your point, yes, for wrestling and the stuff that you used to do for that when we would do the um, get-togethers for the pay-per-views, we used to do, and just explain to people behind the scenes who are listening to this, we used to get together when Jim lived closer. We used to get together for every wrestling pay-per-view, and there was a group of us that got together. Jim also ran a f- fantasy like wrestling league with a point system that he developed that we all participated in. It didn't just go for the pay-per-views, it went for the weekly shows, where we would pick certain wrestlers for our group based on whether they won, lost, and what events happened either before, after, or during the match, you would get points. So you could have somebody who was losing every one of their matches, but yet would still develop serious amounts of points for you based on things that they did. Um, in that process. So you were strategically grabbing wrestlers that you thought were going to be featured prominently in certain ways that would generate points um, in the system. But you used to um, dress up or and, and do themes that were relating to it. It was a lot of fun. It was a great deal of fun. It was very creative. But to where you're going with this, it's not stuff that you'd necessarily wear at a convention. Nah, nah, I've never done any convention. Here's the thing with me, the convention stuff. Mm-hmm. Of superheroes, the only one I, I would be able to accurately pull off would be like Harvey Bullock because I'm, I don't have a superhero physique. I know that. I could walk around, hey, look, there's fat Superman. I could pull off that costume, but you know, actually a Superman costume I wouldn't accurately be able to portray just because of my – physique or hey look there's short batman oh, okay yeah that's me i'm short batman <laughs> you know it's so i've never really did cosplay just because i never felt i could really do it justice unless i tried to do a joke like uh you know fat out of work out of uh, shape skeletor you know or something like a jokey a jokey costume is something i could possibly pull off you know or i don't know you know that kind of thing but and then i'm like i you know, for me, I'm like, yeah, it'd be funny to do, and it'd be entertaining. You know, I'd be, I'd laugh a little bit, but I'm like, I'd, I'd rather spend my time going to this different stuff and then doing just that joke. You know, so it's for me, it's you know, again, I like the cosplay. I always, you know, there's always some interesting, cool stuff that you get to see in that. But for me, where I see myself, the limited limitations I see on myself, I wouldn't want to put that much effort into it. Just for that, yeah, that makes any sense. It, I wish I really appreciate people who I love taking pictures with people who have got great costumes. Uh, I I wish I had the skill set or the time or time is a piece because you know they're all doing it too where they're trying to find the time because it's something they're passionate about. I guess you know our passion you know is. It manifests itself in doing things like this, right? Being able to sit down and to develop and produce a podcast um, during the course of the week. 
um, you know, and, and appearing on other podcasts. And, uh, you know, this is this is the second podcast I do now. I'm doing a cybersecurity one for education as well right now. And I was just on um, Is It Jaws? We were doing uh, Thor Love and Thunder, which is going to be coming out soon. Uh, that's, I guess, where a lot of my time goes. And I would love, though, I'll see what happens when I create this mask. You know, is this something else that I'm going to find time for? Um, I hope, I, I really like cosplay. I think the stuff's cool. I've just never been, I think there's a confidence level in it, too. I, I, I admire that about people who do it. I think there's a confidence level in the fact that you create these cool things and you make the decision to wear it and show it off. I would admit that even if I were to create something like that, I don't know that I have the confidence that some of the people do. Yeah. So I say that with a, with a nod and respect because I do think when you embrace that culture and you you know put together the costumes and you're making a decision to wear that all day long and, and make that your branding when you're there, there's, there's something very, very bold in doing that. And I have a ton of respect for anybody from what I think was the finest costume to the ones that are like clearly early attempts at, I I think it's something where embracing that and, and wearing that as your statement when you're there at a con and just embracing that experience is cool. I love it. I love seeing all kinds of costumes. There's never been somebody who's been in a costume and like, um, you know, we all get silly and snarky and say, Oh, they shouldn't have worn that or that type of thing. I disagree. I think, I think that's the, bravest thing you can do is go to a convention and embrace your fandom and show it off. That's the spot where you're supposed to be able to do it, and I applaud everybody who does it. I haven't gotten to that point where I've either had the costume or the ability to create the costume that has made me feel confident enough to do that. And I guess I should openly say that. That's one, what's my biggest holdback? I would say it's that. <laughs> yeah. More than anything else. Because I love fandom, I love part being a part of the culture, and I think that's something, when I go to a convention, I feel that I'm constantly bumping into people, whether they're in costume or not, who I love talking to because they're like-minded. They're, they're embracing something that I enjoy as well, and I always appreciate the, I would say, the, the passion that you're able to do that. This worries me. Um, Warner's Brothers Discovery is expected to begin announcing layoffs. When I say it worries me, I don't think anything's folding. I don't think the sky is falling or anything like that. But when there's mergers, what ends up happening? Layoffs. And that's yep. one, of the, one of the benefits of a merger. It's it's never a gloom and doom thing. And, and please know that I say this with respect. I always get worried about people losing their jobs. That's something that bothers me. Um, when there's restructuring, one of the things that is the that gets people... I would say financially excited for it. I want to say financially excited for it, not morally or ethically or all those pieces, is the fact that when you merge, you do not need two of certain positions or you know as many of certain positions because now you can have people monitor. There's not going to be HBO Max Discovery. That's going to be one streaming service. So there's going to be an ability to pool resources and you're going to pull, hopefully your best talent off of those and and unfortunately you're to lose some really quality talent in that process because it's a way to save some money yeah. and and make something more profitable. I James Williams Stubbs posted this and the first thing he said and I totally agree with this. I'd like to think they'd leave DC Comics alone. Um, and he said but I'm not naive. I I don't know how that restructuring is going to impact the comics. My thing is that they're still going to be the comics. That's always my worry whenever restructuring or reorganizing or new leadership comes on. Are you going to get somebody who doesn't understand the value of the comics and supporting that particular branch? And right now, I think more than ever before, that always is a worry of mine. Um, I I think in if you take a look at the Marvel model, I think the Marvel model also works because the comics are there. <laughs> so I think if they're looking at that, that gives me an encouraging sign of the comics are going to be okay. And I really do feel that. I'm not, I don't know that I'm naive in that process. Uh, I would honestly argue that the work that's being produced by the comic book arm right now is stellar. And there's a lot to be excited about. Fingers crossed on that particular piece that that's going to be just fine. Um, there's the article here that uh, the Flash is uh, testing great. Mandy uh, jumped back in. Remember our friend Super Mandy? 
Um, she jumped in saying that she's suspicious about the timing of this one because a report came out over the weekend that Batgirl was testing just as well um, as Black Adam. But then the new, you know, she's right. You know, look what look where that went. So I'm hoping that this film still sees the light of day. I I really really do. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, characters returning from the Joker. Uh, the, there's a really cool article about uh, why this was the right time for the Sandman, which is cool. Harley Quinn season four is happening, despite all of the which. Kind of, that's kind of a no brainer if you're watching season yeah. three that's a great show and i'm have you watched any of season three yet yeah yeah great show i'm so absolutely glad absolutely wonderful loving it i'm glad there's a season four yeah I, I, i'm all in on uh, harley <laughs> if you're on the fence at all um of watching uh league of super pets we have um uh, one of our friends has posted um a rock filled post credit scene and if you don't mind seeing a post credit scene, it's a cool way to get kind of a flavor for the film. Because I think it's a great movie, and if you've been missing this one or dismissing it as a kid's movie, um, it's, it's, I mentioned Pixar, I mentioned Illuminations. If you like those kind of films because of the fact that they're kind of made for everybody in the family, you'll really enjoy Super Pets, and that's a good way to get a taste for it. Poison Ivy, the one that we were upset about not being an ongoing. It's not going to be an ongoing, but they're, they already have uh, green-lighted a, another six-issue arc. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so that's... Very happy to see that. Terrific. Pennyworth Season 3 trailer. Uh, there's going to be a title change for the DC HBO Max series, but I'm... Pennyworth, uh, I, we've talked about... You've watched Pennyworth, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great show. And I'm glad that it's a great example of another show where that doesn't need to be tied into anything. It's just a great exploration of the character of Alfred Pennyworth. I think that show's fantastic. So I'm glad to see season three coming. It's, uh, you know, he's, I liked his uh, comment. Uh, I watch this show, enjoy its nonsense. And he said, and I forget it exists every time. It's easy for that show to get lost in the shuffle. I think he's making a good point there. I see it, and I immediately jump to it and love watching it. I When we talk about the greater tapestry of the DC programming, it is one of the ones I forget to throw in. But yet, I love it, and I'm glad that Season 3 is coming, and hope it's as good as Season 1 and 2, because I'd love to see a Season 4 if it continues down the same vein. Is that something that you're protective of, that show? What, Pennyworth? Yeah. Um, I, actually, his comment is exactly how I think about it. Okay. I do forget about it, but every time I watch, I'm like, oh, yeah, I love this show. This is awesome. And one of the things I like about it is, for me, it's a solid show in that his name could be anything other than Pennyworth. It could have absolutely no connection to Gotham or the Bat, and I would still enjoy the movie. I would still enjoy the show. You know, they could they could completely change all the names, change all the stuff, and not have it be about Alfred, not be about connection with the Waynes, not be about, and just have it be a story on its own. And it's a and, you know, it's a great story and a great show. There is a cool for anybody who's interested in the multiversity. There is a cool artifact that uh, has annotations to that multiversity chart that Grant Morrison had created. And it's it's a link to grantmorrison.substack.com and appreciate the posting of this. Um, it's I get fascinated on the he tried to really do a good job and I you know a lot of this still exists but now has been expanded with all yeah. of the storytelling and I think that's always going to be the case with the DC's multiverse. It's something that is fluid that you can play with. But I love historically that there have been writers that have explored things like Mark Wade's hypertime that he explored back in the day. There's things that that have been added to the idea of explaining the multiverse and and the way that it all works. That I'm glad those concepts keep coming back and art and writers keep playing with them. They should be concepts that grow and expand and change and evolve with story t- storytelling. But it's definitely worth checking out uh, the notes. On the uh, Substack, because I get, do you get fascinated by that? Like the heady stuff as far as yeah. like, the hows and whys of how it works? I do too. I get into that. It looks like the Black Canary solar f- solo film has survived the Warner Brothers cuts. So I'm fingers crossed on that one. I, it's, there was actually a couple comments in there that they'd rather have seen the Batgirl movie. And I want to see both. So I'm, 
I'm not in the camp where I put one before the other. I'm a Black Canary fan, but I would really, I'd love to see the Black Girl movie too. So I, I get the point. But um, is that something you're, I guess, let's talk about that. I'm excited for a Black Canary film if it's done right. And I liked the Black Canary. This is the Black Canary character from the Birds of Prey movie. Are you excited about seeing that character in a solo film? Yeah, actually, I, I'm i glad that this survived because this was one. And I agree. I, I, I still want to see the Batgirl movie. But that was a really cool uh, portrayal. And I was like, yeah, I, I could see definitely her own movie. You know, if they wanted to do a second uh, Birds of Prey movie, I'd be all in on that. I think, you know, they had a, for me, they had a solid enough story because, you know, Harley was awesome. It was a Harley Quinn movie. She's the main focus, but the support cast that they put around her were just as equally cool. And I would like to see them, you know, so she's definitely a character that I was like, that's, she's neat. Let's do another movie with her. Cool. You know, do a Birds of Prey movie. Cool. Just do a solo movie. Cool. I'm happy with this. Again, I, this kind of throws into my idea of I just want more content. You know, I want to see more movies out there. Let's try some of these characters. Let's try. You know, Black Canary is not known in the non-comic book, uh, you know, group. You know, the people who like comic book movies really don't, you know, who don't read comic books really don't know who Black Canary is. Yeah. You know, that's why I would really like to see, you know, a movie with her. Batgirl, the non-comic book people knew her because of the bat flash they know because of you know the various other stuff aquaman they know you know black canary is one of those characters that you know aside from people who know comic book fans they really wouldn't know who black canary is maybe you know oh i saw some animated thing with her in it but not even you know there, there's never really been a heavy portrayal of that so she's a character that i would have liked to really seen you know get the get a solo movie and see where it goes through or do a birds of prey movie. They, they could have done another birds of prey movie. And I would have been 100% happy where the birds were the focus of the movie and not Harley. Yeah. Interesting point. One of the things I thought was interesting about what you just said, I'm kind of processing this. I love Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. So I want to be really clear on that. And the idea of more films or more films where she's either the lead or, or the co-star as Harlequin, yay. Because I've loved her in Suicide Squad, I've loved her in Birds. So the idea of exploring that character more works for me. I think you said something interesting there that I completely agree with, and it's where I think there needs to be a... This is where I'm going to kind of backpedal a little bit and go, this is where there needs to be a plan. Whether I don't know if it needs to be some big tapestry for every single film, but if you're going to take that Birds of Prey universe that they crafted and start spreading it out into solo films... Have a plan for that because I think there's a point in exploring Black Canary without Harley Quinn being there, and that's what you're touching on as far as I wouldn't mind seeing the rest of the birds and, and you know some films and exploring them. I think there's a point to that because when Harley Quinn's there, admittedly she's a very and needs to be a very big presence, and it's kind of what you're there to see, right? You don't want to see Harley Quinn and and all of her craziness. I adore that so. I never want to diminish my love for that character and what she does, but it's always nice to be able to see more of the of the universe that they're crafting there. And that Black Canary is a different Black Canary. I would like to see that Canary like developed and see more of that character. I'm interested in seeing that. You mentioned something about Batgirl being more well-known. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit because... I think you're right as a concept. So as an overarching concept, I think people who know that Batman exists know that Batgirl exists. When are we? When was the last time we've seen Batgirl in media? And, and that's what I mean by Batgirl is well known. You know, just because she's got the bat on the chest. Mm -hmm, just in mm -hmm. the same way Batwoman was known because of the bat on her chest. Sure. People didn't know who Batwoman was. People didn't know who the Batgirl's uh, backstory or side story or anything like that. But there's an easily recognizable because of the bat on the chest. And that's the whole thing I'm based on, you know, people know who she is. I people don't she... know Barbara. They don't know any of the stories. They don't know Oracle. You know, pe the general crowd doesn't know that kind of stuff, just like the general crowd didn't know about uh, Batwoman, you know, and, you know, that ver ver that version 
the current version of her. Yeah. So that is a thing where they would have to educate the audience and sell the audience on. But if a person who only, you know, like I've got friends at work who mm-hmm. they don't read comics, they have no desire to ever read comic, but they enjoy watching a superhero movie. Mm-hmm. So they watch the superhero movies. They watch. They sometimes watch some of the superhero shows, but they don't really go into that. They're more they go to the movies. You know, mm-hmm. and the one guy's like, "Oh, I'm a Batman fan." He's never read a single Batman book. He knows nothing about you know. He just knows the Batman movies, and he enjoys Batman movies. You know, if a Batgirl movie came out, he would 100% have seen it because he likes Batman. He knows Batman. He would have gone to that. Did he see Wonder Woman? Um. No, I don't think he did. Yeah, and, I'll be honest. I think because I, I remember talking to him about it. And when I talked to him about it, he said, no, I haven't seen it. Is it any good? I'm like, it's amazing. It's absolutely wonderful. Go see it. Trust me, you will love it. And I even gave him my guarantee on that. I told him, I flat out told him, if you go to a movie and you don't love it, I will pay back. I will give you your money you paid for that ticket. That's how much I love the Wonder Woman movie. And he never came back to me saying, hey, you owe me some money. So I'm assuming he saw it and thing, but we never really talked about it afterwards. Yeah. And then the question becomes, did he see it? I think Batgirl is the same problem Wonder Woman does. Um, and that the reason why I reference Wonder Woman, in the sense that I think as a concept, people overall knew Wonder Woman. I don't think they knew who she was. I think a much larger portion of our population now understands Wonder Woman because they've seen the film, right? Yep. That's why I'm so disappointed about the Batgirl movie not coming out. I think you're right. I think people know the concept, but I don't think they know who Batgirl is, who Barbara Gordon is, in the, the same way that they know who Batman is. Uh, and, well, I would make an argument, though, that people know who Batman is, but unless you've seen the movies, you wouldn't know the concept. So I think there's an, uh, we know who Superman is, we know who Batman is, but until you've seen the movies, seen the media, you don't get to know the characters. There's a, there's a greater awareness. It's harder to get a Black Canary movie, I think, notice. Uh, because that's really a concept where people are going in blind, and I get your point off of that, that it, it's not a concept the general public is going to know. That one is going to require some marketing to get people to go and see it. And you you really have to tie that to something else. So, you know, re- remind people of Birds of Prey or something like that to get them to go and um, give it a shot or, or, or have some really strong trailers. Because, I mean, like any other film, if there's a strong enough trailer, people will go and see it. That's where the That's where Marvel's hitting it out of the park. Because you can slap that Marvel label on there and people are going. <laughs> yep. And, and that's where you can do some of your unique concepts. In most cases, they've had some that haven't, haven't gone as well, but people overall will go and see it multiple times, if that's the case. Um, John Stewart, Emerald Knight one shots coming. And uh, it's going to be this, the previous, that Jeffrey Thorne, the previous creative team, is going yep. to uh, come back together for it. I enjoyed that series, so I'm excited for a one-shot of more Jon Stewart stories. Uh, I'm hoping that the comic company, spinning out of Dark Crisis, has some plans for the Green Lanterns, because I I feel like they've really lost track of what was their hottest line a few years ago. Yeah, I'm, again, I was very excited for this. I want more Jon Stewart. Mm-hmm. He is my lantern. Yeah, you know, I, lo- I love the lanterns. I love the concept of the core. But for me, if you know the, the old adage, "gun to head," you got to pick one, John Stewart. You know, because there's so much you can do with that character. There's so much you can do with the man behind the ring. That I really love this character. So I'm very happy we get more. And like you, once everything is done with Dark Crisis, I want the core back. Yep. Now we're seeing that the cores have a pretty good prominent place in the in the universe. It's starting to grow again. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're seeing John. It's starting to grow with him. It's starting to, the rest of the core is starting to come back. Hal has a big part in Dark Crisis, and the core has a big part in Dark Crisis, trying to figure out and fight back the big evil that's out there. So I'm hoping when everything's said and done, we get a Green Lantern core back. You know, and I'd love to see. Again, John, you know, just all the big names. I want them each either you know, a, a core book or some solo books and a core book or however they want to do it. I want more than one Green Lantern title. Yeah, I really do. I, again, 
you know, a John Stewart solo title, a Hal Jordan solo title, fine. You know, plus give me that core block. Give me that core block too. So I, you know, there's so much they can do with the Green Lantern core that I think, you know, I don't understand why it's not always one of the top books out there because, you know, we saw that they can do so much. You know, just in these simple characters, just you start developing a, a member of the core that no one ever heard of. Yeah. Make up somebody brand new. You know, you can take them from rookie to veteran, you know, in a series, and you're just like, this is awesome. You know, and add into it, you have your regulars, your, you know, your known lanterns. You know, you can do great stories with them. I think what says a lot about the, the lanterns is there's been a lot of great podcasts that have spun up around the lanterns. A lot of them are friends of our show, and I, I say that with love and respect of the fact that uh, you know they've, they've been friends of ours over the years. Um, Myron Rumsey being one of them in particular, um, who has uh, developed a, a great podcast spinning out of Green Lantern. But you know, as you take a look at um, them, as a, they, it seem, they seem to have gotten lost. So I was glad to see them featured so prominently in Dark Crisis and what's going on with them, and and. Uh, you know, we're going to be talking on our next our ep- next episode midweek about the one shot that just came out, and I think there's a lot to discuss. Uh, James Williams Stubbs posted the Jason Aaron a link to the Jason Aaron Substack, a week in the life of a comic book writer. This Substack thing, I just noticed that's the same site that Grant Morrison's was at. It was GrantMorrison.substack.com. I, Substack's got to be a thing. You know, I've got to have to dive deeper into Substack because it looks like a lot of comic book creators are on this Substack. I feel like I should be checking this out and following what they're posting because I love that kind of stuff. I love the fan outreach that's going on. So I've got to learn more about who's got a Substack because I think that's awesome. Yeah, and I know it was funny. I was sitting there and like, wait a minute, this looks kind of cool. And I, I still haven't had a chance to read it. So I don't know exactly detail, but I'm going to start diving into this place. It seems kind of neat. Yeah, so this looks like something to hit. So thank you very much for posting those links. Um, one of the things that you and I both wanted to talk about this week, um, and you, you mentioned this earlier about uh, having a quick conversation about it. You know, we talk a lot about the comics on the show, but we're also collectors of various different kinds of swag. And, you know, we, we've we had a longtime friend of the show, Freddie Williams II, who just recently released... Um, just got released his uh, black and white statue. And this got kind of lost in the shuffle for a while. When I say that, not that particular statue, but the whole line of black and white statues with the reorganization and restructuring at DC. And I'm so excited for this one. I just got mine. And I know you just got yours. This is beautiful. It's this gorgeous statue. And I've sent pictures of it to friends of mine, who some of who are comic fans, some of who are not your traditional comic fans, and the amount of comments on the fine details of the statue that I've gotten from people, where they're like, "Ooh, I want to get that." You know, I mean, they're, they're casual fans where they will get a Batman statue because they're a Batman fan, but maybe don't necessarily to the point of what you said earlier about a friend who re- watches the movies doesn't read the comics. I've got friends of mine who are going to buy this statue because they want it for their man cave or their, you know, their basement or for their display case because of the details on the capes, for example. Like, it's this wonderful pose of Batman with his arm outstretched to a bat that's in front of him. And there's details in the cape of, you know, battle damage that you see this flowing cape with this really cool battle damage to it. I just love it. The pose, the look on Batman's face, the the sense of wonder to the statue. Uh, I have a number of Batman black and white statues, but I did not collect all of them, but I have a lot. They've always been ones from favorite artists. They've been ones that have been unique. They've been in different interpretations of Batman. I'm very picky on the ones that I get because I collect a lot of things. I'm, if I'm going to be dropping my bucks, I'm dropping my bucks on ones that like stand out for me. This was a no-brainer for me. Yes. Um, because it just is magnificent. And what I was pleased about is I knew what it looked like, you know, at first, you know, because you see images. This is a great example of one when you see it three-dimensional and you actually have it there and you can turn it and look at it and really appreciate every angle of this thing. It is mag. It's really magnificent. Yes. I'm, oh, I'm really in awe. Yeah, I, I was very excited because it was funny. You sent me the picture and I'm like, wait, 
it's out already? Because I didn't know it was out. So I jumped on Amazon because we're like, yeah, it's on Amazon. So I jumped on Amazon and immediately <laughs> bought it. And then Amazon had a fast turnaround. It was sure. only a couple days. I was like, that like kind of surprised me how fast the turnaround was because the box came. Oh my gosh! So yeah, this thing looks absolutely brilliant, and I'm so happy. You know, this is one of those. Sometimes I get, I do get buyer's remorse sometimes with some of the stuff I buy. I've got a bunch of stuff that I'm like, ah. I really didn't need that. This one, there's no buyer remorse. There's 100%. I'm like, okay, where are we going to put this now? This will be displayed prominently. <laughs> it may go in my front window. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It is It is a gorgeous statue. It's here. I'm like, I was actually just turning around and looking at it because it's right behind me because um, I have my Batman black and white statues in my recording room, my, off, my office where I record podcasts. And there's a, there's a whole shelf devoted to black and white statues. Um, there's a, with a front row and a back row. This one's in the front row, and it's gorgeous. It is yeah. really really gorgeous and an imp- an important piece. Uh, I didn't see this one on DCBService.com because what I usually do every month is I go and look at statues as well as you know collected editions and things like that as separately. Like I will I will go through them and see if there's anything that's coming out. I didn't see this one at all. If you buy your statues at your local comic shops, make them aware that this is a statue that you want and they should be able to seek it out for you. So, you know, so please embrace your local comic shop and have them grab it. Um, if you're a, a DCB service uh, shopper like we are, uh, reach out to them. Um, and that's something I probably should have said on previous episodes. They, uh, you know, they're a show sponsor and their company is really good at if they're able to procure something, getting it for you and getting it on your list for order. Um, they have things in stock often that are not um, a part of the normal pre-orders or they can get some things. So let them know that you're looking for it and uh, do that. It's available on Amazon, as we mentioned. Um, that was very easy to find it there. And I got, like, the turnaround time was really great. I pre-ordered it because I saw an article that, uh, I'm sorry, not an article. Freddie posted on his Facebook and his wife posted on uh, her Facebook that uh, it's out or, you know, it's pre- available for pre-order. So I pounced on it. And uh, it was, it was, they normally, DC does a better job at promoting releases of, the statues and things, but it seems with this reorganization, and it's not exclusive to this statue. I haven't seen announcements about Batman Black and White in a while, and that's unusual. And so that's why we wanted to. You you'd suggested we should get the word out about this, and I couldn't agree more because it, it, take a look at uh, the stuffs out there. DCComics.com I think has done some postings on this kind of stuff, but um, it's. Uh, been kind of a stealth release and uh i think that's one of the reasons where podcasts i think are helpful as far as getting the word out i want to thank as always the people who have taken because we have a number of people that took some time to post articles in our facebook group and uh thank you very much for that we rely heavily on this and i think it it led to this being an episode because there was so much to talk about i think it was a good time for us to talk about the 10 10 year plan and just what we want to see from it because as fans, I think we all are in that kind of what does Warner Brothers Discovery merger mean and that type of thing. You get protective of the stuff. I want more content out of this. And I think where streaming services have been successful for me has been the wealth of content that I've gotten. I do get worried when you start to see mergers of them and you hear about cuts. It's like, what are they going to see? What are they going to think that is not valuable? I'll use an example from Netflix. So um, to tell you why I get nervous, Bone, Jeff Smith's Bone was supposed to be an animated series on Netflix. It's been cut because Netflix has, you know, been showing a loss compared to what, you know, for subscribers and things along the way. And um, that worries me when I was so high on seeing that series. It sounded like it was going to be finally, you know, when you see how great Sandman is, it's like, Oh great! We're finally going to get this awesome Jeff Smith Bone series, and and you know J- Jeff Smith's an Ohio guy, and Bone you know comes out of our neck of the woods. You know it's Columbus, so he comes out of our neck of the woods. Uh, I am, was so sad to see that this for cartoon books that isn't coming to fruition. I hope that isn't dead. I hope that we get to see something out of that because. Bone's amazing. One of my favorite series. And I'm, I'm sad to see that's not going to come to light. That gets me worried when you see mergers. Like, what are they going to cut that I really wanted to see? And um, 
you know, what kind of things that don't do we not know about that have been cut? Because <laughs> I'm sure there's things that like didn't get to the release stage that may have been axed as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we didn't hear any announcements of things that uh, are perhaps being reworked behind the scenes that we may have enjoyed. But uh, fingers crossed on this murder. Here's the thing. I want this to be successful. So I'm hoping whatever reorganization and restructuring they do, uh, I hope that the people, anybody who loses a job over that gets a job quickly and is you know, recognized for their talent and value and gets, gets employment. I'm hoping out of this restructuring and reorganization that it leads to something more successful even than what was happening before. Because that ultimately leads to job security for the people that are there, leads to greater job opportunities in the future, and leads to content and continued content for us. So I'm hoping this merger is successful and leads to new things. It's an interesting time for streaming because we're, we're following something that is still in its infancy. It's in the very early stages. A lot of these companies are just getting into, you know, year three, year four, uh, and a lot of the things that are, you know, competing with that the Netflix model that was out there much longer. And it's going to be interesting to see how this all shakes out, and what what that means for content availability, what it means for uh, cable and traditional TV, because you're hearing just as much about people switching over to cable and satellite services again that went all streaming. So I'm very curious to see how this all shakes out as uh, time goes on. But I'm glad we spent some time today talking about not just streaming, but media in general, because I'm excited for films, for television, and uh, exclusive streaming content. And fingers crossed to where that all goes. We are crystal men from Mercury. We have no quarrel with you. I would like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's 1-440-388-4434. Dr. Norge on Skype. You have comments or things you want to talk about with the show, please feel free to call in. We love having you part of the show. RagingBullets at gmail.com is our email address. We love having your comments that way. RagingBullets.com is our show website. That's where you'll find out news about the new episode releases. It feeds into Twitter. It feeds into our Facebook fan page. We are also proud to be part of an amazing Facebook group community, and they really are a big part of the show. Keep in mind, there's two Facebook groups when you go to uh, Facebook. The first one, you'll see like a larger list of people. That was our old Facebook group. It's still active, and I didn't get rid of it. And we also have one that has less people in it, but it's a newer one. What happened was at one point in time, Facebook, because of, I think, uh, the Raging Bullets name or something like that, read it as a website that they were flagging, shut down our Facebook group temporarily. So we started a new one. Then all of a sudden it miraculously, I, I complained and it miraculously came back. We had had all of our main participants fish over to the new group. And they participate there. I kept the other one active because of the fact that there's legacy content there. And people will post things in there from time to time. And a lot of people, I'm sure, that sign up for that do what I do. I've signed up for a lot of Facebook groups where I like it showing up on my feed. I like seeing the announcements. And I kind of set it and forget it, if that makes sense, and walk away. And it's fine. I love when people do that. So I'm probably going to post episodes in both. But I want to be clear that our newer group is the one that we participate our discussions in and things like that. I'm keeping the other one active just because I think it's a great resource for people. We have people that will post their blog entries and stuff like that on the old one. And I'm fine with that one still existing. It's just a matter of our smaller group is the one that uh, is more intimate and regularly run by our great friends who keep the Speeding Bullet segments going. Actually, they crafted this episode. So I want to thank everyone that's been posted in our Facebook group. They are members of the show. Jim and I re-record this, but without them behind the scenes doing that, you wouldn't get episodes like this. You're getting two episodes this week, and I want to thank everyone for participating because that... It motivated us to do a secondary episode so we could get caught up on the news and having some lengthy discussions. The About Us section is how you can link to us on all kinds of social media platforms and gaming platforms. InStockTrades.com and DCBService.com are our sponsors. Jim, what's going on over at DCBService.com? We have uh, GCPD, the Blue Wall. 50% 50% off, only $199. And we have Gotham City Year 1, 40% off, only $299. Thank you, DCBS. 
Deathstroke Inc. is a great series, and if you missed it, they've got the hardcover over at InStockTrades.com. It's $29.99 regularly, 50% off, only $14.99. Fourth World by Jack Kirby box set, $120 regularly, 50% off, only $60. Bucks. Commandy by Jack Kirby trade paperback volume one, $40 regularly, 50% off, only $19.99. Thank you, DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Do not forget about our spoiler warning contest. And it can be, entering this can be as simple as just sending us a concept that you'd like Jim to play with. And then that counts as an entry. So feel free to email those in. Feel free to send them in through our show voicemail line. Whatever is the easiest way for you to get those to us, you can then get a shot at a trade paperback of your choice, hardcover of your choice from DCB Service or InStockTrades.com, and a spot on the show. Or you can script the segment first. If you're like, hey, guys, I don't want to come on the show. It's kind of not my thing. I don't want to do the podcast thing, but I want you to talk about this. You can do that as well. You can be in charge of the segment. We'd love to have that participation. So thank you for everyone who's considering participating in the contest. We'd like anybody who wants to be a part of that to be a part of it. Our next episode, we're going to be back midway through the week. And we are going to be talking about the newest uh, issue of Detective Comics and Worlds Without a Justice League Green Lantern. And uh, we will see you in a few days. Bye. All right, you guys. Are you ready to sing your song? I right, here we are. Yeah, let's sing it now. Okay, this should be fun. Now get ready for your cue. Okay, Sean? Okay. Okay, Jim? Jim? Jim! Okay, fellas, get ready. That was very good, Sean. Naturally. Uh, Jim, you're a little flat there, so be careful. Jim. Jim. Jim! Okay. Excellent job, guys. Let's sing it again. Yeah, let's sing it again. No, 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 that's enough. Let's not push it. Push it? What is that? Yeah, what are you talking about? No, I don't... I didn't mean to buy that. I think you're going to do my song. Sean, Jim, I don't know how long you want the song to go. Look, it's our production.